Hello there, my fellow Inner Sphere historians, and welcome to another lore video from the universe of Battletech. I haven't done a lot of videos on actual major events from Battletech history, so hopefully the addition of today's overview is gonna be a welcome one. Now I did make four videos on the Succession Wars previously, and I hope you're gonna find this episode as interesting too. It concerns the infamous Amaris Civil War, with Stefan Amaris being sort of a discount Horus from Warhammer 40k. Like I said, this is gonna be an overview, so I will not go into too much detail on the military operations involved. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Amaris Civil War, also known as the Amaris Crisis, the Amaris Kerensky Civil War, the Starlink Civil War, and the Amaris Coup, was a series of events which led to the dissolution of the Star League. This war, fought in both the periphery and the Terran hegemony of the time, occurred between 2766 and 2780. Among many things, it resulted in the destruction of the Rimworld's Republic and Operation Exodus, the departure of Alexander Kerensky and about three quarters of the surviving SLDF away from the Inner Sphere. The chain of events leading to Stefan Amaris's destruction of both the Star League and the Rimworld's Republic began in the year 2751. The first lord of the time, the fair and just Simon Cameron, died in February as he toured a mining complex on New Silesia. It was later proved that his death was a murder, but who was behind it and why they did it remained unknown. Unfortunately, this left the eight-year-old Richard Cameron as the first lord, ruler of the entirety of the human sphere. Alexander Kerensky was named protector and lord regent of the Star League, but Stefan Amaris quickly penetrated the Terran courts and enacted a devious plan. The young Richard would become a paranoiac and a megalomaniac under the tutelage of Terran courtiers, with Stefan Amaris chief among them. By the year 2762, when Richard finally came of age, Stefan Amaris was already a close confidant of his. Richard began his reign with a controversial order. All the house armies were to be disbanded, and they were forced to join the SLDF with the edict called Order 156. When the great house lords refused, Richard had no choice but to accept the refusal, but he disbanded the Star League High Council ruling the human sphere by himself. Richard then issued the Taxation Edict of 2763, which was a steep increase in taxes throughout the human sphere, but especially in the periphery. As the tax increase was a clear infraction of the reunification treaties, the governments of the periphery quickly became militarized and prepared for another inner sphere invasion. This in turn resulted in the new Vanderburg Uprising, started by the secession of 18 planets from the Torian Concordat in 2765. This forced the SLDF and Alexander Kerensky to redeploy a lot of units to fight in the periphery. By July 2765, over 60% of the units normally stationed in the Terran hegemony had been relocated to other places, leaving the heart of the Star League dangerously undefended. It was at this point that the First Lord revealed his secret treaty with Amaris, allowing for the redeployment of the Rimworld's Republic military to take their place. Anger at the use of foreign troops was only placated by the Republic's continued loyalty to the Star League, and Republican forces were allowed onto hegemony worlds. However, the number of the Republican units was secretly growing daily, with twice as many regiments arriving as officially listed and under the orders of Richard, they were given complete access to the SLDF bureaucracy, and allowed to learn the workings of the space defense systems. By December 2766, more than half of the Republican military had been redeployed to the hegemony, equivalent to 16 divisions and twice as big as the remaining SLDF units. With all of these pieces in place, Stefan Amaris was ready to act. 
On December 27th, Stefana Maris had a 9 o'clock appointment with the First Lord in his private audience chamber, in the palace in Union City. Amaris was allowed through the palace's security system, accompanied by four bodyguards, all unchallenged. He found the First Lord eagerly awaiting his arrival, and after exchanging pleasantries, he presented Richard with a wrapped box. After opening the box, Richard uncovered a jewel-encrusted laser pistol, bearing the crest of the Amaris family. Stefan held the pistol up to the light to reflect out the jewels, and then leveled it at Richard's forehead and pulled the trigger. Immediately he seized control of the automated defense systems in the palace, using the control panel within the audience chamber which Richard himself had proudly shown Amaris how to operate. However, Stefan was unaware of the full extent of the security system, which had picked up the laser blast and immediately warned the palace guards and Richard's personal regiment of Royal Black Watch. The palace guards attempting to enter the audience chamber through the hallway found themselves cut down by hidden laser systems, while the Black Watch suffered heavy losses in the traps set for them by the 4th Amaris Dragoons. Still, the coup was on the brink of failure. A platoon of jump pack equipped guards flying low across the palace's roofs to avoid anti-air fire were able to reach the roof of the audience chamber and two lances of Blackwatch battle mechs were able to escape the traps and confronted the 4th Dragoons at Gorst Flats. They were protected on one side by high forested hills and the Puget Sound on the other, and this forced the Dragoons to confront them individually. Unfortunately, both these efforts were ultimately doomed. After losing 10 battle mechs to the entrenched Blackwatch soldiers, all of whom had been graduates of the famous Gunslinger program, the Dragoon commander withdrew his forces and wiped them out with a nuclear strike. All across the hegemony, similar dramas played out, as the Republicans used surprise to wipe out regular army units, many before they could even get to their barracks or troop ships, especially through the use of chemical and nuclear weaponry. A number of units were able to escape the initial onslaught, including elements of the 191st Royal Battle Mech Division on Terra, and proceeded to wage a guerrilla war against the Maris which lasted for years. At least five regiments were able to hold out against several Republican assaults until their destruction by repeated nuclear bombardment. Most units, however, if not entirely destroyed, were so badly mauled in that opening day that they effectively ceased to exist as a fighting force. Or they took heed of the ultimatum that Amaris broadcast, falsely declaring that he would kill the First Lord if they didn't surrender. Those that laid down their weapons were forced to dig their own graves and executed summarily. By the end of this day of infamy, 95 of the hegemony's 103 planets were under Republican control, as well as many intact fortifications and space defense systems. Having secured the Terran hegemony, Amaris turned his attention to the last perceived threat to his reign. Gathering all 79 surviving members of House Cameron within the palace throne room, he gave them an ultimatum. Swear allegiance to him or die. One by one, the members were brought before him, sitting upon the Starlink throne, and were asked to submit. The first 20 refused, and they would return to the rest of the group, but the 21st, Jason Cameron Bashina, agreed to bow down to Amaris. With a grim smile, Amaris proceeded to murder Jason with the same pistol he had used on the First Lord. Realizing that they would die either way, the rest of the family attempted to rush the throne, but they were cut down by Amaris's guards. When the smoke cleared from their charred bodies, Amaris left the throne room and ordered it sealed. Across the hegemony, similar efforts were made to destroy any vestiges of the Camerons or the Starlig and make way for the new Amaris Empire. The first act of Stefan, after renaming the Starlig into the Amaris Empire, was to order Alexander Kerensky to maintain operations against the Torian Concordat, which Kerensky flat out refused. Both sides then requested aid, which was flatly refused by each territorial state and each inner sphere state, and thus started the infamous Amaris Civil War. 
Although the SLDF was the most powerful fighting force in the human sphere, it faced a gigantic Republican war machine, numbering more than a hundred regiments of battle mechs alone. So you can get an idea, one regiment of battle mechs could have anywhere between a hundred and two hundred mechs. Kerensky began his operations by conquering the Rimworld Republic, led by Stefan's regent, the patriotic Mohamed Selim, an unambitious administrator Stefan could trust. The SLDF took Terra Prime by 2769. Upon completion of operations within the Rimworld Republic, the SLDF took a couple of years to prepare some more, and then Kerensky began Operation Chieftain in 2772 to begin the proper liberation of the realm. The SLDF then invaded Terra in 2777, and by 2779 the outcome of the battle was a foregone conclusion. On 30th of September 2779, Stefan Amaris was taken captive by the SLDF, and Alexander Kerensky himself punched open the palace doors in his Orion battle mech. Stefan and his accomplices were treated humanely until enough evidence was found to confirm Stefan's atrocities. He was then executed by firing squad, with the order coming from Alexander Kerensky himself. After the execution of Stefan, a long campaign was conducted, both officially and unofficially, to end the Amaris family line. Anyone with a claim to the Amaris throne was executed or lynched. Despite the end of House Amaris, the Rimworld's Republic might have endured. However, the loss of the core of the Republic to annexation to the Lyran Commonwealth, as well as the vacuum left by the death of the Amaris family and the Rimworld's Republic military, meant that the remaining independent planets, literally more than 24 systems, were left to fend off for themselves. Dozens of banded kingdoms arose in the vacuum of the collapse of the Republic financed by privateering and mercenary deals. Whatever was left persisted as periphery independence or disappeared entirely. In the wake of the death of the Cameron line, the Great House Lords coveted the possibility of becoming the next First Lord. Alexander Kerensky was summarily stripped of his title of protector in 2780. By this time though, Kerensky had had enough of this crap. As the lords bickered over succession, Kerensky made ready to depart the inner sphere forever. By his own reasoning, the succession to the first lord's throne was gonna be a bloody affair to say the least, and he would not let humanity's defenders become pawns of politicking nobles. Following Kerensky's famous Exodus Order on July 8, 2784, most of the SLDF gathered at New Samarkand and departed on the 5th of November. The descendants of these people would not be discovered again for more than 250 years when the clans finally came back. In the power vacuum left by Kerensky's departure, the Star League High Council dissolved, and Minoru Kurita unilaterally declared himself the first lord of the Star League. The announcement didn't go well with the other great houses, and it succeeded in sparking off the first succession war and the decline of the human sphere. If you want to learn more about the succession wars, I actually made a video for each one in this very same playlist. And this, my friends, has been the short overview I wanted to narrate to you concerning the Amaris coup, aka the Amaris Civil War, aka the Starlink Civil War, etc. There are elements of this event which are obviously more lore-rich than just this episode, like Operation Liberation for example, or the Periphery Uprising. But those events are gonna make good topics for future episodes, provided you guys enjoy the overall topic of course. What are your thoughts though on the Amaris Civil War? Are you fans of this major event of Battletech history? Do share your thoughts or questions or Anything else you might want to say in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. This is GDN signing out.